Uh, I, I would actually be looking for a bottom somewhere right about where we are, 40, 4,200, 4,300. I, I feel like the market is right now is very close to finding a, a, a tradable bottom or like a bounce for short-term momentum traders. And if this bounce, if we do find support here, if it has legs, we could be going right back up to 4,800 and testing the 2022 highs in a relatively short period of time. It could be reached by like Christmas, which would be a pretty exciting move um, uh, for a lot of investors to see that uh, recovery. A recession is still likely and may be declared by as early as late 2023, or at least that's what's being reported in the news today. We're going to discuss how exactly a recession is going to impact markets, how much stocks are likely to decline from current levels, and which assets will do well with our guests today. But first, let me tell you about the news source I'm using right now, which is Ground News, a news aggregator site founded by a former NASA engineer. It's a very comprehensive aggregator. In this particular example, there are 130 articles that pop up on this issue from a variety of sources and viewpoints. What's unique is that Ground News offers bias indicators that give you a comparison tool so you know how the stories are framed and where on the political spectrum the angle lies. From the left, they emphasize the Fed's persistent concern about inflation despite its drop. The center frames the issue globally, while the right concentrates on the Fed's cautious approach in avoiding a deep recession. Reading further into the headlines, like from the left, for instance, we can see that the source is ABC Australia, and there are also ownership, factuality, and bias tags, so you can get a sense of how this article may be influenced. If you're like me and you want to streamline the way you read news, go to ground.news slash David Lin by clicking on the link down below and you'll get a 30% off unlimited access today. Thank you to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Christopher Moulin is here to break this down for us. He is the chief market strategist at thetechnicaltraders.com. Welcome back, Chris. Good to see you as always. Ah, same here. Thanks, David. We had you back um, a month ago, exactly a month ago. Back then... Uh, on the 1st of September, when you were latched on, the S&P was trading around 4,500 points. It's retraced uh, to about 4,200 points now. We're speaking today on Wednesday, October 4th, 4,250 is the latest reading on my screen. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been a bad month. What's going on? Is this just seasonal? Yeah, I mean, you could you could say it has to do with some seasonality wise. I mean, I can show you the charts, kind of what I'm seeing here in the markets. And this is the weekly chart of the SP 500. Seasonality wise, you know, the second half of September, the first half of October, that one month window is typically a bearish time in the markets. And we have seen that when we zoom in here, this is the weekly chart. The last four bars have been down. Uh, we might have still a, a little bit more weakness here, but overall we are, I think, going to be primed and ready for what could be a, a very exciting and, and bullish uh, close to the year if the stock market can get traction. And the reason I, I bring that up is when we look at this big picture here, uh, the chart pattern has got a very nice formation where it has formed a, a rounding uh, bottom. It's had a very strong rally to the upside. And I, from a technical standpoint, I like a complex, they call it a complex correction. It's an ABC or a three wave correction, which is A, B, and then C. And it's this, this C wave down that breaks this previous pivot low that flushes the market out. In the last two weeks, we have seen lots of panic selling across the stock market. Shares are just being dumped across the board. Uh, you could argue it's, it's seasonality wise. We have had the Fed come out, talk about rates staying up or going higher. I mean, all of these things are more or less uh, short term bearish on the markets. But this three wave correction is what cleanses uh, the market of weak uh, investors, meaning they're panicking out. And those shares are all landing in the hands of new traders, new investors who are comfortable at this price, who want to hold things uh, going forward. So this is kind of a cleansing. And it, it, if this is a bull flag pattern or a pennant formation that's kind of forming, we could see another very big move up going into the end of the year, which seasonality wise, as you know, is a very strong quarter for the markets. And maybe we're going to come up to the 2022 highs. Maybe we're going to blast through those. It's going to be very interesting to see where we go. So, I mean, just to kind of clarify, short term wise, we are in a downtrend right now. But if this weekly chart gets traction, we could have a very strong rally and uh, could be a very different picture by the end of the year. 
It's just interesting how uh, your process works. Can you describe the differences between your analysis for the short term and the long term? In other words, you're looking at this chart, you're seeing this short term downward momentum, but how do you know or how do you make the conclusion that at some point this is going to reverse? Yeah, so the, the the long term chart pattern here is is fairly bullish. The overall trend is up. The moving averages are moving up, and this is a a controlled pullback when you look at it from a weekly standpoint. Uh, it's still above kind of key moving averages, but if we were to drop to the daily chart, which shows you know much more near term volatility, I'll just uh, clear this chart a bit here. We are are making you know. Momentum wise, we've got the moving averages are now sloping down our shorter term moving averages. Uh, we do have lower lows and lower highs. And you put those together and the moving averages are a good way to tell you which way the trend is going. If they're trending down, the trend is most likely down. So when the moving averages are falling, price is making a series of lower highs and lower lows. That is an indication that you're in a downward channel or a falling market. And uh, until those change, you know, for a short term trader, you still need to be bearish. You need to be on the sidelines or being very defensive here because uh, the market could continue to collapse and fall very quickly. So that's kind of how I, I like to gauge it. The long term chart is still, you know, holding up, trending higher. It's in a pullback where the shorter term chart is showing that momentum has shifted and uh, short term trends are down. Okay. Uh, Chris, when you look at this chart, do you think to yourself, I'm going to switch positioning, meaning if the short term trend is still down or there's a more of a risk downwards and upwards, let's put it that way. Would you stay would you stay short or on the sidelines now before you see positive indicators or definitive indicators for a rebound? Or are you just going to stay long and ride this out because the longer term trend, like you said, is up? Right. So it really depends on the strategy. So our long-term investor strategy, which runs off the weekly chart, is still long because I do think the, the long-term charts are pointing to higher prices. Now, for our shorter-term strategy, we're sitting on the sidelines. We exited a little while ago. We're sitting in BIL, which is a, a three to uh, a three to six month uh, treasury note or one to three month treasury note ETF. So literally, we're sitting on the sidelines collecting interest each day and just waiting for a new opportunity. So we're not going to try and pick a bottom here. We're going to wait for the trend to change direction, start moving higher for the moving averages to turn up. And then we're going to look at what other sectors and commodities are doing. And if money is flowing into the market again, or if it is just kind of a kind of a dead cat bounce, sometimes there's not a lot of momentum behind the market. And uh, when we look at majority of sectors, they are all in both a short term and a longer term downtrend. So there's not a whole lot of um, momentum in this market right now. So we need to let the, the market rally and we need to see confirmation that a lot of sectors are taking part of it before we jump in. So we won't buy in at the bottom. We'll be getting in at some point once it's made a bottom and is confirming that it's in a new uptrend. So uh, on Wednesday, we're speaking on Wednesday, the uh, ADP data came out. Uh, private payrolls numbers increased by 89,000 for the month, which is down from an upwardly revised 180,000 and below the 160,000 estimate from Dow Jones. As a result, Treasury yields pulled back slightly and, uh, and stocks uh, rose on the day. Can we just take a look at yields? Because yields have been pushing markets around somewhat. The 10-year in particular... Uh, we've seen levels not seen since 2007. The market is near an all-time, well, not uh, near a 15-year high. What's next, based on the charts? Yeah, I think last time you ta we talked, I was talking about how I think interest rates could, on the 10-year here, get up to five, five and a half, maybe even five and three quarter percent. I think I mentioned back then, and it is breaking out the. When we look at the, you know, the big kind of massive trend here. We've definitely reversed. We've been in a falling environment uh, for interest rates for a long time. Now they're definitely in an uptrend. We haven't seen this this price level since 2007, which is kind of, you know, right when the stock market actually started the last major correction and went into the financial crisis. So it's interesting that we're coming back to this uh, price level, and I feel like the market is. Um, while the stock market's holding up and doing all right, 
you know, I feel like the behind the scenes of the economy are slowly crumbling. People are starting to, I think, be concerned about money. And this, the, the, the rates and mortgage rates are changing so fast. I was talking to somebody last week and they have um, a 1.9% mortgage. It comes up for renewal in March and he's very worried and frustrated because he could have sold his house about a year and a half ago for about $250,000 more. He's listed it now for uh, 250 grand less and he can't get a bite. He can't sell it. And when his mortgage comes up for renewal, his mortgage rate is going to triple. And he's like, I don't even make enough in a month to pay for the mortgage. And so I think we're going to see this. This is in Canada. There's three to five year mortgages are the most popular. And we're going to start seeing the three years coming up in the five years. And it is going to be a, a nightmare because of these high rates, uh, mortgage rates. And I think they're even higher in the States. I think mortgage rates are up around 8% in the States versus 6% here in Canada. So I, I think we're, you know, just tip of the scale. We are right back to interest rate levels that we saw the last financial crisis take place. Homes are way overvalued. They've shot up so high. And now everybody's going to get hit with a really high mortgage payment when they go up for renewal. And if we get into a recession and, and jobs start getting cut and employees start to get nervous, the banks are going to tighten up and it'll be even harder for people to renew their mortgage, even if they have the funding to potentially support their new interest rates. So the rate, whole area around interest rates and mortgages is going to be really interesting uh, where, we're, where we're kind of headed. I'm just curious, in this particular case, if somebody's not able to cover their mortgage payments when it ticks up, what's the option here? If you, if you sell your home and buy another one, you're still paying high rates. Right. Well, they would, they would go to rent. Right, they have the rental market will get very strong. They have to liquidate uh, and rent, uh, and that's just kind of the way that goes. And of course, the house will go into foreclosure. That's something my dad used to do years ago. Um, he used to pick up banks. The banks would actually call him and his partner, uh, say, "Listen, we got all these properties. Which one do you want? Give us a bid." He used to be huge into real estate, uh, so that's something that we could we could walk right back into, which nobody's even really thinking about it, or at least the general public. Uh, they don't realize the, the danger that's really around the corner, I think, when it comes to to real estate uh, risk. I think the other risk is that some people think that just because the Fed is probably done their rate hike cycle, that rates are going to come down. It doesn't always follow uh, perfectly. And in fact, there's probably a bit of a lag, right? If you, if you see the Fed stop raising rates, it doesn't mean the mortgage rates are going to stop raising. And conversely, if the Fed drops rates, it doesn't mean interest rates on debt and mortgages are going to come down right away. Is that something you've noticed? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even after the 2008 financial crisis, the market bottomed in, you know, 2009, uh, the housing market was, you know, the softest in 2012, like three years later, I, at least in Canada here. So there's a huge delay. These are massive trends that and, and changes in the financial system that take a while to work themselves out. People don't get affected until they come up for renewal. So there is definitely a big delay in all, all of these things. You might be good now, but it's going to catch up down the road. Okay. Uh, so let's just recap the S&P 500. I want to move on to um, a different segment. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the floor you're looking for? Uh, I, I would actually be looking for a bottom somewhere right about where we are, 40, 4,200, 4,300. I, I feel like the market is right now is very close to finding a, a, a tradable bottom or like a bounce for short-term momentum traders. And if this bounce, if we do find support here, if it has legs, we could be going right back up to 4,800 and testing the 2022 highs in a relatively short period of time. It could be reached by like Christmas, which would be a pretty exciting move um, uh, for a lot of investors to see that uh, recovery. Just to clarify, when you said that we're in a short-term downtrend, you were talking about what has happened last month, right? You're not talking about this downtrend continuing because you you're, you said we're near a bottom. Am I, am I correct? Am right. They, the, the pullback we've seen in the past uh, month and a half, uh, I, I, think, I think it's about to find a bottom here. Uh, and then I think we could go uh, higher it, to test the re recent highs uh, of 2022. Excellent. Well, uh, Chris, let's uh, try something a little bit different. Instead of going to the next chart, I'm just going to ask you what you're most bullish on right now. Could be the stock markets that we've talked about just now. Could be something else. Yeah, I would say uh, it depends on the time frame you're looking at. But um, I mean, the dollar 
typically does well when there's fear. I think the dollar is going to have a little bit of a pullback, but overall, I think the U.S. dollar index is going to continue to to rally fairly significantly. Um, in in terms of another asset, I mean, if the markets are going to have a big correction, I don't really want to hold a whole lot of of stocks. Uh, really, I have to follow the trend. Right now, the trend is down for stocks in the short term. Uh, so to me, the dollar is kind of the one that's trending up very strong. Um, you can be in a, another type of position, which isn't all that exciting, but a uh, bill, which is a, the treasury note, which you can just kind of collect uh, monthly interest and dividend payments uh, until there is a, a decisive move. Right now, the markets are oversold. Um, and and I think trying to short a market here is, is a high risk play. I think trying to pick a bottom or trying to play a bounce is also high risk. So um, the dollar and, and the sidelines right now, until we get a new decisive move uh, in a, in a direction here is kind of what I, what I'm looking at. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm looking at the DXY in 2007, in October, 2007, the dollar, uh, the DXY was reaching a trough. It bottomed around April, 2008. And during all throughout the recession, it peaked until uh, it peaked at around uh, 846 in 2009, January 2009. So it actually shot up during a recession. Some people were saying that the dollar weakens during recessions. Um, maybe it maybe it has in other rece recession cycles. I'm just looking at 2008, yep. and we saw a big rally in the DXY during a recession. Does that make sense intuitively to you that the, the, that the dollar would rally during market volatility? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, we saw we saw the same thing back in the 2000 tech bubble. The dollar screamed higher. I think we're actually much more closer to a 2000 kind of uh, market reset that could take a long time to unfold. And I think the dollar is going to go back up and hit uh, what we saw back in, in 2000, which is around the, the 120 mark. But typically we see when, when there's blood in the streets, uh, there's huge panic. The dollar is the one that that really goes up in value. And stocks and everything else plummet. So to me, a uh, very strong play during a recession is actually the dollar. That uh, it's just played out very well in the past. Even on short-term charts, uh, the stock market sells off really big. The dollar tends to go up. Uh, so it's just kind of the way that I found that the dollar seems to move, and um, I really like it because it's a, a fairly consistent moving asset class. Uh, it's not really volatile. So a big day in it is like half a percent, three quarters of a percent. Uh, so it is a very controlled way to kind of manage your money and take advantage of, of weak times. What's the trader's logic here for flocking to the dollar during times of volatility and risk off? Because you would think that during a recession, this is my logic, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would think that during a recession or during periods of downturns, you would expect the Fed to perhaps loosen monetary policy or cut rates, which would bring down the dollar, uh, You know, assuming other central banks aren't more dovish. Uh, what, what am I not getting right there? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, nobody knows for sure. And I, I think you, you've got a good point. I think... I don't. I don't know if people just pile into the dollar and drive the dollar up. I think. I think the currency market moves more as a global kind of school of fish. And when people get nervous that there are recessions coming, weak times are coming. It's not just in America. It'll be, you know, in other countries, and they'll they'll naturally kind of want to flock to a currency that they're comfortable with. Uh, and the U.S. is still seen as kind of like the global power, the reserve currency. So they might sell their own currency and move to the dollar, especially if it's trending up. Then people are going to want to move their money to a currency that is increasing in value versus holding their own that's falling. So it's kind of once it's trending up, it actually helps feed more investors to want to hold uh, different uh, currencies. Similar time frame for the next question. What are you most bearish on right now? Um. Most bearish on what time frame are we looking at here? Are you saying like six um, months? We have out to compare or? apple. We have to compare apples to apples. So the same time frame that you looked at for the DXY will apply the same analysis for a bear call. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I if that same pl applies, then I would I would say equities markets uh, are going to have some of the biggest downside potential here. I think they could fall 30, 40, 50 percent fairly easily uh, if this unfolds. Okay. Uh, that's after the rally that you talked about, right? Just to clarify. Correct. Yeah. Okay. 
Very good. Um, let's talk about um, some assets that uh, you mentioned to me offline that were interesting. Uranium and uranium stocks had a big move. Can we comment um, on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just find it it's really interesting. I noticed this, this yesterday when uh, we had a, a mentoring session with subscribers. We look at uranium. I'm just going to flip back to the daily chart here. If we take a look at uranium stocks, uh, We've seen from from the lows here. We've seen they're up about forty one percent, and it's funny because uranium stocks, as you might have quickly saw a glance there, if we go way back in time, have they used to be valued very high? They have been out of favor for uh, a very long time, and they're just starting to come back to life now. And that's a lot of it has to do with um, you know uranium not being needed as much people not wanting to deal with it because the people have this belief that it's a very dangerous and, and dirty energy, which um, you could argue both, but I think it is a, a relatively safe way to generate a lot of power uh, in the long run. Uh, but it, you know, this, this so-called dirty, scary energy has, is rally 41%. And when we look at, for example, tan, which is solar, which is, you know, supposedly clean energy. And we look over the exact same time frame. uh, it is down, you know, almost 50%. So it's really interesting how two kind of extremes are kind of moving. And I don't know, somebody would probably argue that uranium might actually be a, a clean energy. I've heard cases for, for both sides, but it's just a very big, you know, different move between these two extremes of kind of uh, energy uh, production, which I thought was really interesting. And, you know, the whole solar space was on fire after the COVID crash, and now it's fizzling right back out um, and I think it's got, you know, I, I think a lot of these stocks have got a lot of room to still fall. In fact, if we take a look at the ARK K ETF, uh, you can see here it had, it was one of the most popular ETFs. I swear everybody piled into it and it's all they wanted to own. And even though the stock market is like equivalent to trading right here, right now, anybody holding these growth stocks are down, you know, from the highs, seventy six percent, and and what we've been seeing is a lot of this rally that we've seen in the stock market this year. A lot of stocks are floundering; they're refusing to to rally back up. There's not a lot of participation. Saw this just the other day. We saw the stock markets close relative had a, a somewhat positive day, uh, but almost every sector was down, and it was just a couple of tech companies holding the entire index up masking this kind of uh, false belief uh, that, you know, the markets are doing okay, they're holding up. But the reality is most people's portfolios are plummeting while the stock market is up trading near the highs and it people find it very frustrating, but they don't understand how the markets move. And if you hold specific types of sectors or stocks uh, during different stages of the market, you're going to dramatically underperform. And, um, you know, that's this is the scary thing is, you know, this is trading down here. This is consolidating. Uh, and this could very easily start a new leg to the downside. This is a bearish pattern that could resolve down into the teens, which I've talked about. And I think I even mentioned it to you many, many months ago that uh, if we go into a bear market, these ARK ETFs are going to completely crumble and fall a lot more. And a good view of this actually is the Russell 2000. If we look at the Russell 2000, uh, it put in a kind of a, a topping phase through here, and then it had a big measured move, a big breakdown, and now it is consolidating, just refusing to get traction. And that's what the market does. It has a pause and then drops and pauses and drops. So the markets are very, very, you know, they're not super strong. This rally this year has been just a tech-based rally. There's not a lot of uh, participation across the board when the tech fizzles out. Uh, we are going to see things, I think, plummet and uh, the dollar will rally and equities are going to be one of the dogs you just do not want to hold. You know, I'm just thinking the Russell 2000 has been flat all year. And of mm -hmm. course, it doesn't include the big tech stocks. Even if the tech stocks fall, I wonder if the mid caps are going to do OK. What's your take there? I, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at, Chris, is if we just take the big tech companies out of the yep. equation completely, what's the rest of the market going to do? Uh, I, I think the rest of the market will fall. I mean, I, I don't think I, I think there's a lot of weakness in selling. And if the if the big tech companies fall, typically that means people are selling not just the tech, but they're selling everything else. The, the money's either flowing into the markets or out. The tech 
uh, you know, the tech definitely helps leverage and hold the markets up. But if the techs are going down, uh, it's going to, you know, if, even if you take them out of the market, if techs are going down, people are still selling their other positions as well. And small cap stocks, mid cap stocks don't have the same liquidity. They fall even faster. And uh, it's just it's just kind of like, um, yeah, the, the smaller they are, the easier they can fall. So typically during a risk off environment like that, when people are selling their tech stocks, moving capital away from the big tech companies, perhaps even other blue chip stocks, where does that capital go in this environment, historically speaking? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, everybody's got their own thing. Some people shuffle into metals. People, a lot of people go into Bitcoin. Some people are going into di uh, dividend paying stocks. Or uh, generally, we, you know, in the past, we've always seen bonds and utility stocks as kind of places of safety. But I mean, if you've looked at utility stocks uh, in the past week and a half, they have fallen off a cliff and. You know, this once high dividend paying uh, sector ETF and, and people go to these kind of conservative, slow moving utility stocks has completely fallen out of bed. And I mean, it is dropping. I don't know what it has dropped uh, uh, percentage wise from these from the highs. But I mean, you know, that's down, you know, almost 30 percent um, for what's supposed to be a conservative play. And that's just like the bond funds. They're down over like 50 percent. And that's why. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't believe in in the same old strategies of of buying and holding, and you know, bonds are a defensive play. That's why I use technical analysis. If something is trending down, we're not in it. We will exit it, or we'll find something else that's going up. I don't believe in in holding. Uh, you know, I hear this all the time. They're like, "Well, I'm moving to this fund or this this company has got a great dividend. It's like an eight percent dividend." And then it drops like 10% in a week. I'm like, it, it doesn't make a sense to hold something that pays you 8%, but then it can drop that in a, in a day or three sometimes. Uh, it's People are lured into this. Wait, what kind of, what kind of company pays a 10%? What kind of company pays an 8% dividend with that kind of volatility? <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> what, what are we, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe it's self storage. I just pulled a number out of a hat, but <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, that, yeah, that I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be there either, Chris. <laughs> you have to make a good, making a good point. Um, but, but Chris, let's talk about, uh, I, I'm curious, to, just speaking of divergence, let's talk about the metals. The gold uh, bullion has been flat. It's slightly down about 1%, down about 1% on the year. Um, uh, I don't know if you factor in the latest price movements from the last hour. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's uh, moved a bit more, but anyway, it's, it's slightly flat on the year, but the gold miners, if you take like the GDX, for example, that's like down 11%. Yeah. Why the big divergence there? If you take a look at the rest of the markets, the stock markets are up. So you can't say that, well, the stock markets are pulling down the rest of the equities. Like that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, the, precious metals and mining stocks have a really weird relationship. Some, sometimes they, they move with the stock market. Other times they'll do the exact opposite. Stocks fall, gold miners go up. Uh, and then you got to throw into the mix kind of um, uh, the U.S. dollar, which you know, when this most recent move, I think with the interest rates, you look at this, the sharp drop in gold miners and silver. And then we just look at it quickly to the US dollar. You know, it has been this, this strong leg. It's almost been a mirrored move uh, in opposite directions. So, you know, you, when you look at the miners, they are the speculative play when it comes to precious metals. Gold's holding up because it's the global, global kind of I don't know, physical reserve currency that people see. Gold moves slower so people can put more money to it and be comfortable. Um, where silver and miners move super fast, you wouldn't want to just go dump like a million dollars into it and lose 8% in one day. Uh, you know, you go to gold and it'll move a half a percent, something you can that's palatable, that has a little more controlled of a, of a commodity. So these speculative moves, when people are nervous, they move away from miners, they move away from silver more so than gold. And uh, and because these are dropping faster, people might actually want to hold gold more so just because it's holding up better. So it's a very difficult, the precious metal space is difficult to trade because it flips and flops between moving with stocks, moving the opposite of stocks. And then we have the dollar involved in, in interest rates and all these things just create, make it a very difficult scenario. A lot of people, you know, so many people love precious metals and miners and, and I do as well. 
there will be a time when they're going to be absolutely amazing. Hopefully sometimes ne- next year, we see the, a major rally in, in this space, but uh, they're very difficult to trade unless we're in like a really strong bull market phase. You have to be very aggressive. You have to be very short-term trader because every pop is followed usually by a big drop. Uh, so they're, they're a tough beast and people, people trade them thinking they should be uh, easier and they, they like them, but it is actually a very tough, I find sector to trade. But when you see this divergence between uh, the miners and the underlying metal, do you think to yourself now is a good buying opportunity? Or do you think that maybe something's wrong with the sector and I should stay away because it's underperformed the underlying asset? Yeah. I mean, the fact that it's underperformed, like, uh, you know, gold, gold has been trading to equivalent to chopping way up near highs, near like, you know, uh, previous highs. We've seen this divergence, as you just said. And so if the market goes into recession, the dollar rallies, we're going to see gold sell down as well, which means if these are already going down when when gold is 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 actually going sideways, when gold falls, these are probably going to pick up speed even more. Um, typically, the ones that are underperforming are the ones that are going to drop even faster when selling real selling pressure actually hits. So I think there's going to be an amazing opportunity uh, once everything is flushed out, if we do get this major correction uh, potentially next year. And I think miners and metals will be very fairly valued, uh, along with uh, stocks as well. But I think they're going to have a huge move going forward. And I think uranium stocks are also going to have massive potential um, simply because of a uh, climate change. Uh, there's so many ways that uranium can be used with these small little f- uh, facilities that can you know, produce so much energy in a very controlled, low risk way. I think uranium is going to come back online and these little um, modular systems are going to start powering states. And uh, I think maybe that's why we're seeing uranium stocks come to life because uh, we're starting to see this, you know, people want to get, see the climate net zero, um, uh, what is it, um, uh, pollution more or less. Uh, yeah. Cr- you know, by 2030 or 2035. So I think this is going to start to play into the uranium space. And I think it's, I think the early money is seeing the potential in in uranium power. Okay. uh, Finally, before we close off, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, strategies around asset revesting. You have a book called Asset Revesting for those of us who may not have seen your work. Tell us a little bit about that philosophy and how it works. Yeah. So asset revesting, that, uh, that's a, 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 a term that Ashley and I coined uh, simply because it's it's kind of between the current trading strategies that everybody uses. To me, there's two risky strategies that almost everyone does in the market. First one is active trading. There are numerous studies across North America, uh, Taiwan, Japan, uh, showing that active traders who actively trade for 300 days or more uh, lose money. 97% of them lose money. So active trading just because you trade more doesn't mean you're going to make more. Um, emotions play a huge part of it. People don't understand how to pos- uh, manage positions. So that's the one thing that everybody, a lot of people do. The other high risk strategy is the buy and hold. If you've been buying and holding stocks and you are in serious pain because of falling stock and bond prices. Uh, and so asset revesting is kind of right in the middle. We do just enough trades. We only focus on assets that are going up. We step to the sidelines and just collect interest on a daily basis when we're not in a position. And it's all about just taking control over capital and finding assets going up and putting our money in there, reinvesting our capital into you know the dollar or um, you know bonds when when they turn up or the equities markets. And we move into one asset at a time. There's usually one asset class performing well. And we want to move into the one that uh, has got the best uptrend. And when it shows signs of weakness, we move to another asset that's on our, I call it an asset hierarchy. So we've got volatile assets at the top of our hierarchy, like the stock market, then bonds, then the dollar, and then like a cash type of position. And so as the markets get more volatile and unstable, we move down the list to slower, more conservative assets. Uh, which is why I kind of mentioned earlier, I love the dollar index because it's slow, it trends nicely, and it can go the opposite direction of the stock market, giving us a way to make money uh, while the markets are falling apart. And this book's philosophies, uh, are they aligned with your own trading philosophies for the technical traders? It is. Yeah, that's that's all I focus on is, is asset revesting strategy. That's our 
our uh, what, what I what I share, what I kind of teach, and all the trades that we put on are all based on just finding assets going up, stepping aside when they're not, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's the nice thing about it is our accounts are usually near up all near all time highs because you know we get out of a trade as soon as it starts to flatline or roll over, and then we wait for a new one. We don't ride things down and. Uh, you know, the 2022 was nice. Our account just slowly kept hitting new all-time highs while the stock market fell 25%. And it's a very slow strategy. There's like five to 12 trades a year, but that's that's all that's needed. You don't need to trade more. There's a certain amount of waves that kind of roll through the market every year. And we just look for these waves. I think the best analogy is I'm a surfer, kiteboarder. And if you think about walking down a beach on an ocean, you see surfers out past the break, right? They're floating out there waiting for a nice clean set of waves. When you see a nice move coming, you, you can see it, it has momentum. And then once you're riding it, you also know when that momentum is starting to stall, when you got to carve off the wave and you're like, this trend is coming to an end, let's, let's wait for something fresh. So I wait for sets of waves to come through the market. We hop on the asset that has the best setup on our asset hierarchy. And then we ride it and then we just scale out of that position as it as it's maturing and then we rotate into a new asset when another wave comes through so that's kind of how i look at it how i navigate the markets okay well excellent uh and <laughs> riding the markets well um i'm just visualizing you with a surfboard and a chart it's just something we don't see very often but uh <laughs> Maybe maybe in the next interview, bring your surfboard and bring your charts. Right, um, Chris, that was a great interview. Where can we learn more about your work? Sure, they can go to thetechnicaltraders.com. And uh, from there, I've got a blog, lots of uh, content, and uh, they can send me an email and they can learn more about the asset revesting strategy there. How have your assets, or how have your strategies changed over time? Um. I mean, the whole asset strategy for CGS has always been around the indexes and bonds. The only thing that's really kind of evolved over time is more so adjusting the strategy as volatility changes. Uh, we've added in the dollar, which gives us some opportunity to pull more money out of the markets. And uh, there's some nice uh, ETFs that allow you to collect interest sitting on the sidelines like BIL. Uh, other than that, I mean, they it really just kind of lives and breathes. So targets and stops adjust with the markets. And um, we really just focus on, foc if, if the money is flowing into a particular asset, we just focus on those, um, those assets, which is equities, bonds, currency, because they're the most liquid, they're the most stable. Uh, we, you can apply it to sectors as well, which we do. But uh, I find it's easier to identify money flowing in and out of the overall broad market because that is like the whole school of fish, the mass, the masses um, moving in the same direction. It's much easier to time and and trade the markets, the indexes itself versus little pockets that are popping and dropping. Okay, excellent. Well, make sure to follow Chris in the link down below. Thank you very much for your time today. We'll speak again next time. Thanks, David. Take care. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe.